everybody. It is great to be with you all today. I hope that you are all doing well. Throughout the year of 2024, as most of you are well aware by now, we are attempting to uh, emphasize our need for fellowship. We've defined fellowship as joining in God's redemptive plan. And it includes the uh, relationships that we build one another, build with one another, but it extends beyond that. That it includes the way in which we try and share the gospel with all people and the way that we try and encourage one another to help grow in our faith. And one of the ways that we are emphasizing fellowship is by taking the time to read a passage every week uh, that emphasizes some aspect of fellowship. And this month we're looking at Luke chapter 17, verses 3 through 6. Let's read it together. Pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in the day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. The apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. And the Lord said, if you had faith like a giant mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. In the book of Exodus, we encounter a contrast between two princes of Egypt, uh, Pharaoh and Moses. Both princes are raised in the palace. Both are educated by the Egyptians and educated in all things Egyptian culture and Egyptian knowledge, all the mysteries and majesty of Egypt. Both are raised up by God. And both witness the miraculous miracles that God would work there in Egypt. And yet, Pharaoh becomes God's enemy, the one whom God would set his face against, while Moses becomes God's friend, his tool, the one who would speak to God face to face. And so the question is, what is the differentiating factor? What's the differentiating factor between these two princes who end up on polar opposite ends and end up in polar opposite places in their relationship to God? What is the difference between the two? And the difference appears to be that Pharaoh chose the treasures and the wealth and the power of Egypt while Moses chose to exchange that treasure for eternal wealth in the kingdom of God. If you've got your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to Hebrews chapter 11. But before you do that, how many Bibles do we have? What a great sight. Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to begin in verse 23 in just a second. Uh, Hebrews chapter 11 is what we often refer to as the hall of faith. And in it we see a list of many of the great heroes of faith. And it is through their actions, through what we see here, that we, we are exhorted to continue on in the faith. For, the, for they remind us of God's power, his faithfulness, his faithfulness to mankind. And, and through the word of God, they continually exhort us to trust God and to trust his promises, for he always stays faithful to his promises. And here we read about Moses, beginning in verse 23. By faith Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that the child was beautiful and they were not afraid of the king's elect. By faith Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking forward to the reward. By faith he left Egypt, not, to, not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Many of us are familiar with the story of Moses. Now, you may recall how Moses is born to the Israelite, to Israelite parents when they are slaves there in Egypt. And it appears the Israelites had become so numerous that the Pharaoh of the time was terrified that they might revolt, terrified that there were so many of them that they might cause a problem there in Egypt. And so he found a way for population control to kind of try and keep the, these Israelites in check. And his solution was to uh, kill all babies two and under, or to all male babies two and under. Well, Moses' parents decided to try and rescue their son. 
So they put him in a basket that has been prepared to float down the Nile. It had been waterproofed, and down the Nile it went. And if you're familiar with the story, you, you know that eventually it's found by none other than Pharaoh's daughter who draws it up out of the water, which is where Pharaoh, which is where Moses gets his name, for he is drawn out of the water. And she sees this baby and has pity on it and decides to claim it as her own. Now Moses has a sister, Miriam, who's hiding off in the reeds, watching all of this unfold. And at this moment, she comes out and asks Pharaoh's daughter, do you want someone to nurse this child for you? Pharaoh's daughter says, yes, yes, please. And so for the first, we don't know exactly how long, but for the first seemingly couple of years, uh, Moses is raised there by his parents and nursed by his mother. But the day comes when he's probably a couple years old. The day comes when he is moved to the palace and there he is educated in the Egyptian ways and becomes a prince of Egypt. And there living in the palace, he had everything that he could want. He had power, he had prestige, he had education, for he knew everything, all the secrets and the mysteries of Egypt. Whatever food, the finest food, all he need do is ask. Everything was at his disposal. All he had to do was ask for it. But notice what Moses chooses to do with what he had. The great wealth of Egypt that was all at his fingertips. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking forward to the reward. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking forward that Moses considered the great wealth of heaven, the great wealth of God's kingdom to be of greater worth than all the treasure, all the things that he had there in Egypt. And so he chose to exchange his treasure for great wealth in the kingdom. Now I want us to contrast Moses with the congregation that we find in Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3, and we're going to begin in verse 14. Uh, and here in the opening chapters of Revelation, there are uh, seven letters that are sent to seven churches, each addressing a different challenge that, the church, uh, that each church was facing. And I want us to contrast how Moses reacted to that which he had with what, how the church at Laodicea acted towards what they had. Beginning in verse 14. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea, write, The words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works, you are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you were lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say I am rich, I have prospered and I need nothing. Not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich, and white garments, so that you may clothe yourself, and, to, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and salve to anoint your eyes, so that you may see. Those whom I love I reprove, and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him, and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered, and sit down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Notice in verse 18, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich, white garments so that you may clothe yourselves, and salve to anoint your eyes. Uh, what John is referring to here are at least two of the rather lucrative industries that the city of Laodicea had. Uh, they were known for their textiles, known for this special salve that they could, you could put on your eyes and help uh, heal your eyes. And so lucrative were these textiles that the city of Laodicea was immensely wealthy. So wealthy, in fact, that when an earthquake would rock the entire region, while most of the cities looked to Rome to provide the finances and resources to rebuild, Laodicea told Rome, we don't need your money, we've got plenty. 
and rebuilt it all on their own. So wealthy was the city of Laodicea that they literally minted their own money. And it seems that some of the wealthy ideals had made its way into the church. Uh, notice what John says. I know your works, you are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Notice that John doesn't identify any one particular thing like he does in some of the other letters. He doesn't talk about those who follow Balaam like he'll do with one of the churches. He doesn't talk about those who've been deceived by Jezebel as he'll do with another church. Rather, he simply says that they are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold. But they're just kind of comfortable. It seems that while Moses had chosen to reject the treasure of this world and instead pursue eternal wealth, it seems that the church of Laodicea had chosen to cling to their treasures and were in danger of losing their wealth. The same question that Moses and the church of Laodicea had to answer the same question of what would they do with their wealth? How would they view their wealth? How would they use their wealth and react to it? It's the same question that we as Christians living in America have to answer. For we live in one of the most affluent, one of the wealthiest countries in the world. And we as Americans are among the wealthiest individuals throughout the world. Now, sometimes when we talk in terms of being wealthy as Americans, some of us might not feel like we're very wealthy. For we don't have billions of dollars. We're not Jeff Bezos. We're, we're not Elon Musk. We don't have millions and billions of dollars coming out of our ears. But if we have a car, if we have a roof over our head, if we have multiple changes of clothes, multiple pairs of shoes, if we have three square meals a day and have clean water, or usually on demand, then we're amongst the wealthiest people within the world. Now, there's nothing inherently wrong with wealth. Wealth is neither good nor bad naturally. And Solomon even goes so far as to say that those who are wealthy should be thankful for the blessings that God has given them. That we shouldn't feel guilty or bad that we have wealth. But we need to realize that we live within a society that communicates that the pursuit of wealth is close to the height of living, for we all desire financial security. Now, I'm not suggesting that we shouldn't be frugal, and I'm not suggesting that we shouldn't be good stewards, for of course we should be good stewards with what God has given us. But I am suggesting that within our wealth, there's a potential challenge. It's a challenge that Jesus talked about. For he said that it would be easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it would be for a rich man to inherit the kingdom of God. Now, Jesus had a tendency to use some extreme examples to make a point. Uh, for example, uh, he would talk about how don't look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye if you've got a giant telephone pole in your own eye. Uh, an extreme example to try and make a point. Th that we shouldn't be focusing upon the flaws of others without first looking at ourselves. And he would talk about that you should gouge out your eye or cut off your hand if they cause you to sin. And he's not advocating that we should engage in self-harm and self-mutilation, but rather he is emphasizing just how much we should hate sin. Jesus has a tendency to use extreme examples to make a point. And here he's using an extreme example of a camel trying to go through an eye of a needle, which is impossible. And Jesus goes on later to say that that which is impossible with man is possible with God. That, that there is always hope so long as God is in control because he can do all things. And through Christ, we always have hope. Nevertheless, we should take his warning seriously. That it can be hard for those who are rich to enter into the kingdom of God. And it seems to revolve around that idea of comfort. Now, who doesn't want to be comfortable? Everybody wants to be comfortable. But there's an element of danger that comes with the idea of comfort. And the first is that we, we might lose our sense of urgency. 
I'm reminded of a commercial that I saw as a kid growing up. It was a Lazy Boy commercial. And it featured this little raccoon looking through a window outside on a cold winter's night. And if you remember the commercial, uh, this raccoon is looking through this window, and he sees this man sitting in his recliner there by a roaring fire, and he begins to sing because singing raccoons are normal. All I want is a room somewhere Far away from the cold night air With one big enormous chair Oh, that's lovely. There is nothing quite like sitting in an overstuffed Lazy Boy recliner, ice-cold drink in one hand, remote in the other with your feet up. It is a glorious feeling. But it never fails that the moment that I sit down and start to get comfortable, somebody needs something. Might be, usually it's you. One of my sons needs something, or uh, Aurora might need help with something, or I might remember that I have something to do. And there's this moment in time, as I'm sitting there comfortable in my overstuffed chair, do I want to do it or not? Do I get up and brave the Arizona heat or do I enjoy my comfort in my air conditioning? And there's this struggle of do I leave the comfort or not? And there's the same struggle that we face with the comfort that wealth can sometimes bring. For we can find ourselves so, so comfortable or so comfortable in the idea of the pursuit of wealth that we might lose our sense of urgency. It's not that we forget that Christianity is important. It's not that we forget that following Christ or sharing the gospel with others is important. It's just we might lose our sense of urgency. and might forget that every day we encounter people who are on a path towards hell. That we encounter people who have not yet chosen to follow Christ. And we can't lose our sense of urgency because of the comforts that are around. The second potential danger associated with comfort is complacency. Car insurance companies like to research where we have our accidents and uh, the distance, how frequently we have our accidents. I assume they want to try and make some more money. Well, it turns out that most car accidents happen within a couple mile radius from our house. And I think what that communicates is that uh, we have a tendency when we're amongst things that we're used to seeing, when we're comfortable, we have a tendency to kind of let our guard down a little bit. We're, we're not quite as on guard as we drive because we're used to everything that's around us. We almost go on autopilot, if you will, because we're so used to everything that's around us. So we become complacent. And the same thing can happen with our comfort and being comfortable with the wealth that we have. That if we're not careful, we can become complacent. We can get used to the nice things that are near us. We can get used to the world in which we live, and we can come to forget that we live behind enemy lines. In a place where Satan roars, roams around like a roaring lion, we can forget that this world is not our home and that we are just passing through and that our eternal home, our eternal wealth is waiting for us. And it is this, the idea of comfort, because of these two reasons, it is the idea of comfort that is the greatest challenge to the church in America. It's not politics. It's not inflation. It's not any of the hot-button issues that we might want to dwell upon, but rather the danger that we might become so comfortable in the world in which we live that we might forget that the treasure we have here is nothing compared to the treasure that is waiting for and that there are others reliant upon, reliant upon us to share with them the gospel message. And so we need to follow the example of Moses. The example to exchange our earthly treasure for heavenly treasure. Notice again in Hebrews chapter 11. By faith, verse 24, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choos choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God. 
When did Moses choose to be part of the people of God? I want you to notice something with me in Exodus chapter 2. Exodus chapter 2, beginning in verse 11. We're going to read through verse 19. I know it's a little lengthy, but I want you to see uh, attention here. One day when Moses had grown up, he went out to his people and looked on their burdens. And he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his people. He looked this way and that, and seeing no one, he struck down the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. When he went out the next day, behold, two Hebrews were struggling together. And he said to the man in the wrong, why do you strike your companion? He answered, who made you a prince and a judge over us? Do you mean to kill me as you did the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, surely this thing is known. When Pharaoh heard of it, he sought to kill Moses. But Moses fled, to, Moses fled from Pharaoh and stayed in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water and filled the troughs to water their father's flock. The shepherds came and drove them away, but Moses stood up and saved them from, for, uh, and watered their flock. When they came home to their father, Raoul said, Who is it that you have come, How is it that you have come home so soon today? They said, an Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the, the shepherds and even drew water for us and watered the flock. Notice how Moses is referred to in verse 11. One day when Moses had grown up, he went out to his people and looked on their burdens, and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his people. Now notice how he's referred to in verse 19. They said, this is their, the daughters, an Egyptian delivered us from the hand of the pharaohs and even drew water for us and watered the flock. Exodus makes it clear that ultimately Moses will choose the Hebrew people, choose the Israelites, for they, he will count them as his people. And Hebrews makes it clear that uh, Moses preferred to be and chose to be counted amongst the people of Israel rather than to, be, to claim and to hold on to the treasures of Egypt. And yet, there's this tension that we see that who is Moses? You see, a Hebrew or is he an Egyptian? For there's a sense in which he's in both worlds, for he is a Hebrew and he is an Egyptian, and which will he choose? And when did he choose to be part of the Israelite people? Is it here? Is it like the book of Acts tells us when he would come to visit the Hebrew people while living in the palace? Is it when he flees from Pharaoh? Is it at the burning bush where he answers God's call to come lead the people out? When did Moses choose to be part of the Hebrew people and to exchange the treasures of Egypt for the wealth of heaven? The text never explicitly states the moment that he chooses. But rather, we seem to see that Moses continually chooses. That he chose when he sided with the Hebrew people. That he chose when he fled. That he chose when he answered God's call. That he chose when he stood before Pharaoh and said, let my people go. That continually Moses chose to exchange the treasures of Egypt with the wealth of heaven. Like Moses, were people who live in two places at one time that we're here upon this earth, and yet, as Christians, we're citizens in heaven. That we're to be in this world, but not of it. And there's this tension of trying to live and trying to be in two places at one time while recognizing that one of them is temporary and one of them is permanent. And that we have to answer the same question that Moses does, of where will we live? What will we do with the treasure that we have? That we, too, have to continually, daily, choose to exchange the treasure here for the treasure that we have in heaven. We make such an exchange when we continually thank God for what we have. One of the dangers of uh, having things, one of the dangers of wealth is that we might over time come to recognize the blessing great as more important than the blesser. That, that we might come to worship the blessing over and above the blesser. And we are to continually thank God, recognizing that he is the one who has blessed us with what we have and that everything our have, that we have is because of him and belongs to him. And we make the exchange when we choose 
when we choose to set aside that which we have, to relinquish some of our resources to serve him. Now notice I said resources. I didn't say just money. For of course we, we choose to exchange one for the other when we put money in the offering plate as we did just a few minutes ago. But we also make that, that exchange when we choose to use our time not for ourselves but rather for the kingdom of God. One of the questions we have to ask is, how can I use that which I have for the kingdom of God and to glorify his kingdom? I want us to look at one last text. It comes from Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 34. It's at the end of Moses' life. Moses has been told that he's not going to be able to go into the promised land because he disobeyed God and chose to strike a rock rather than speak to the rock. But God brings Moses and shows him the land. We pick up in verse 1. Then Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo, to the top of Pisgah, which is opposite Jericho. And the Lord showed him all the land, Gilead as far as Dan, all Naphtali, the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, all the land of Judah as far as the western sea, the Negev and the plain, that is the valley of Jericho, the city of Palms as far as Zor, And the Lord said to him, this is the land which I swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to your offspring. I have let you see it with your eyes, but you shall not go over there. So Moses, a servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him in the valley of the land of Moab, opposite Beth Peor. But no one knows the place of his burial to this day. Notice the scene. God has brought Moses to a place where he can see all the land. And in my mind's eye, I see them sitting there uh, like two old friends because God shows him all the land. The land hasn't yet been divided. Shows him all the land and says, this is where these people will be and this is where these people will be. And can you imagine what this will look like over here? And in my mind's eye, I wonder if they didn't take the time to reminisce a little bit as well of how did they get here? All the challenges that they'd faced, all, all the times that God had come through and provided just like two old friends. And Moses dies. And notice verse 6. And he buried him. Who's the he? Who's the he who buried him? Because there's only two people. God and Moses. And Moses is dead. Moses can't bury himself. So God buries Moses. What a picture. It's a picture of God rolling up his sleeves and burying his lifelong friend. Who wouldn't want to have that kind of relationship with God? The kind where at the end of your life, God has had such a relationship with you and you've been such a friend to God that he rolls up his own sleeves and buries you himself. But this moment comes about only because Moses made the choice to exchange the treasure he could have had for the wealth in eternity. And you and I have such a magnificent opportunity for at the end of our lives, it's not just that God buries us, but that as Christians we walk through those pearly gates as his, not his friends, but as his children. And such a magnificent reunion it will be. But the reunion will only take place if we choose to exchange what we could have now for what awaits us, the great wealth of heaven and eternity. Perhaps you're here today and you want to begin a relationship with the one who loves you most, the one who sacrificed everything so that you might be his child and have that which awaits in heaven. And there's nothing that would excite us more than to help you begin that journey which starts at baptism. Or perhaps you're here today and you just need the prayers of the church. If there's any way we can assist you, won't you come as together we stand and sing.